I'm very pleased to present before you my second report to the Human Rights Council and also to introduce with my friend uh, uh, Najad Malamjid the joint report on child sensitive uh, reporting, counseling and complaint mechanisms. I would like to start by thanking all of you for your strong support to my mandate and to the agenda that brings us all together, both within the United Nations Forum but also at the regional and national level. Your support means endlessly for the cause that we need to pursue. The last year was crucial to advance the process of follow-up to the recommendations of the United Nations study on violence against children and also to consolidate strategic partnerships to prevent and address violence against children and certainly also to secure firm support to my mandate and my office. Strategic initiatives have also been undertaken by the United Nations and I want just to remind you of two important achievements made over the last year, the adoption of the Global Plan of Action to combat trafficking in persons, and also the endorsement of the roadmap for achieving the elimination of the worst forms of child labor. And of course, as you know, very recently, the Committee on the Rights of the Child adopted a very important new general comment on the right of the child to freedom from all forms of violence that I'm confident will guide governments in their future work. Critical strides have naturally also been undertaken by regional organizations, civil society organizations, political groups, and also national independent institutions and child-led organizations. For me, the most important challenge has been to, institutionalize, to help institutionalize regional governance structures and help develop regional strategies to prevent and address violence against children. And I'm happy to note that this is an area where important progress has been achieved. Firstly, as you have seen in my report, important political commitments have been undertaken in all regions towards violence prevention and elimination. And in fact, in most instances, there has been also a high level monitoring mechanism established to assess progress and to identify positive practices and promote cross-fertilization of experiences. In some cases, regions have adopted a strategic plan of action, an analytical study to identify challenges, and also have established a peer review process to assess these developments. I believe these are very important achievements. Of course, we need to celebrate, but unfortunately, they are quite insufficient if we think about the many challenges that continue to confront the life of children in all regions of the world. And I feel there is uh, an enhanced sense of urgency when we look at this topic in all regions of the world. As you know, violence continues to be incredibly hidden. It's very difficult to bring it to the open. It is considered to be a social taboo. And for children, it is even more difficult to talk about it. In many countries, violence is considered, for instance, as corporal punishment, as an established practice, as a needed practice. And therefore, it is difficult to report, it is difficult to investigate, and it's difficult to support child victims of violence. So they feel everywhere incredibly overwhelmed by fear, by isolation, by trauma, and by helplessness. So I believe that in my new year, it is absolutely critical to rally efforts with all of you and to join uh, and to strengthen our alliances to really activate the pace of progress that we have been able to achieve so far. And therefore, I'm going to put the emphasis of my work in three particular areas. The first one is to continue to invest in the promotion of the universal ratification of the protocols to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. As you know, there is a global campaign launched with the Secretary General last May, and I think it's very important to note that since the campaign was launched, there is visible progress. We have today 142 states parties to the protocol on the sale of children, child prostitution, and child pornography, which means that basically we are missing only 50 countries. Many of these countries have committed to ratification. In many occasions, they have also ratified ILO Convention 182 that addresses similar issues. So I'm confident that with your support, we can really achieve universal ratification by next year. The second uh, important goal for my work is going to be to conduct a global survey to assess progress 
in the prevention of violence and the elimination of violence uh, since the study uh, was adopted by the General Assembly. As you may recall, 2011 marks exactly five years since the UN study was presented to the General Assembly. It's also, uh, by coincidence, half of my mandate. So I see this as a very strategic occasion to stop and gain perspective of what is working better and what are the areas where we haven't been able to achieve similar progress. Uh, I'm confident that with your help and the support of UN agencies and many other actors at all levels, including civil society organizations, we will be able to assess where we are and where we need to be. And for that reason, I will be sending a, a request for information within the next few months to all member states. And I'm confident that by 2012, we will have an important report to share with all of you to celebrate important achievements together. The third priority for me is going to be to put some attention on some of the settings where violence continues to take place. And, all violent, and violence happens everywhere and in all contexts. But over the next year, I'm going to emphasize in particular violence within education and violence within the administration of justice. And I'm very happy that together with many partners, we are planning a number of expert consultations and thematic reports to mobilize action, to take account of good practices, but also to reflect to Together on how to address persisting challenges. Now, Mr. Chairperson, I want to turn now to the joint report conducted uh, with my friend, the Special Rapporteur on the Sale of Children, Child Prostitution and Child Pornography. I'm very pleased that this report was conducted at your own request, and I, f I find it's really visionary from the Council to have sought that a joint report be developed on an area that has been incredibly forgotten until today. Um, this report addresses, in a way, uh, what we know about existing counseling, complaint and reporting mechanisms around the world, and it was done with the contribution of many governments and many other partners within and beyond the United Nations system. As you know, the right to counseling, to reporting and complaint mechanisms has been recognized by many important international human rights treaties. And at the World Congress Against Sexual Exploitation of Children and Adolescents, there was a particular commitment that was undertaken to have these mechanisms in place in all countries of the world by 2013. I think we are getting very close to this date, and I hope that the report will help move us quicker to that goal. The area covered by the report was addressed by the UN study on violence against children, who called for all states to have these mechanisms and to support children, including through telephone helplines, to access professionals that would be ready to give them to listen, first of all, but to give them advice and to su support them in finding the needed support and assistance to recover from any incident of violence. So our report provides an overview of available mechanisms. It draws attention to positive experiences and good practices in different countries, but it also emphasizes several challenges that together we can address. It addresses many efforts made by governments, by national human rights institutions, by civil society organizations, by community-based organizations. And I think one important aspect of the report is that everywhere this has been in the agenda. Unfortunately, however, this has been addressed in a very piecemeal mode. And therefore, we see many fragmented initiatives everywhere, but they are not connected and unfortunately they are not perceived as part of a robust child protection system. And therefore, children feel very ambivalent about where to go and how to seek assistance to overcome situations uh, of violence against them. So one of the findings of the report is that these mechanisms are very often unavailable, but above all, they are not accessible to children and they are particularly not accessible to the most vulnerable children. And tomorrow you will address an important topic. Children living and working in the streets is just one example of those that are not being reached by these services. We have also confirmed that when these services exist, they lack very often the resources and the professionals also lack the skills necessary to give the right support to children in need. But what is most worrying is that children lack the trust in these services. So even when they know that the services exist, which very often is not the case, and this is in all regions of the world, 
they are convinced that they are not going to be listened to, that they are going to be judged, and they are going to be stigmatized, and they are not going to be assisted. So these challenges are usually very strong, but of course if we talk about sexual abuse and exploitation that I'm sure uh, Najad uh, Mjid will address, it is even more difficult because this is a very hidden, sensitive topic that is incredibly difficult to bring into the open. Even more when we know that in the large number of cases, those who perpetrate sexual abuse and exploitation are people children know and trust including from within the family. So it's very difficult to bring this, of course, into the public domain. So what we see is that parents very often feel that they can protect their children by not telling the story, by not seeking help. Very often they don't know where to seek help from, too. It's another aspect. At the same time, professionals lack the training and lack the guidance to see what they can do about it, how to identify early signals of violence, where to refer the cases to, are they uh, expected to report in which conditions, are they going to be protected if they report any case of violence against children. And we also see that when the cases are addressed, very often many services address the same situation and the child tells the story over and over and over again to different professionals who are experts in different disciplines and do not talk to each other. So we see the medical professional and the legal and the social worker and everyone else. And the child goes through this endless line without understanding who is trusting and who is helping. As you will see, this report touches on an incredibly important topic. But I need to recognize that for us, it is just the first step. It is the first time there is an effort to pull the information together, and we realize that there is much more that needs to be done. For instance, addressing this mechanism within each one of the settings, the education, institutions, or others. So I'm convinced and I'm hopeful that the Council will not look at this report as the end of the process, but I'm very hopeful that you would see it as an important contribution to your own agenda, to the UPR process, to future thematic debates that you will organize on the rights of the child or on other topics. But I want to emphasize one aspect the report stresses, and that is the stealing from existing international standards, the important guiding principles that we have at hand that can help us move forward in this regard. As you will note at the end of the report, we have identified these important seven guiding principles. And they are very simple and they are known to all of us, but I want to very briefly refer to it. The first guiding principle is that each government should establish these mechanisms by law and these mechanisms should be, of course, in conformity with international standards on the protection of children's rights. They should be guided by the best interests of the child and they should be informed by the experience and the perspectives of children who can help us doing much better. Of course, these mechanisms need to be widely publicized. They need to be widely available and accessible to all children without discrimination of any kind. All children under the jurisdiction of any state should have access to these important mechanisms. And finally, these mechanisms need to create a system that is safe for children, that allow children to tell their story without running the risk of having to tell it again, of being revictimized, of being harassed, of being punished, or of having the identity of the child disclosed to the public. And finally, of course, the mechanisms need to an intervention that needs to be speedy and effective and not take many years, which is unfortunately very often the case. Of course, all of this is important, but I'm sure you will agree with me. The most important thing we want to achieve is that children feel that they are taken seriously, their dignity is respected at all times, they are empowered, they are supported, and they will be treated in an ethical manner, being supported when they tell their stories and at the same time not being put at risk. So, Mr. Chairperson and distinguished delegates, I'm again confident that with your visionary decision of embarking on this important initiative, you will continue to support developments that can help us transform what we have learned by doing this report with the experience you have shared with us to translate it into a practical reality for all children everywhere and at all times. Many thanks.